There are a lot of animals that I have always thought are cool. Salmon, hairless guinea pigs, iguanas, silky bantam chickens. But one day in my seventh grade science class, my teacher told us that we would get to see one of the most amazing animals ever in class, a hydra. And I have to confess what I imagined in my head and what was actually reality was a little different, but I'm kind of used to that. Turns out hydra are pretty cool. Hydra are animals that are very small, a few millimeters in length, and they live in fresh water. They can viciously attack and eat their tiny swimming prey, and they can reproduce by budding an identical offspring off of themselves. But if you saw them, you might not think they're an animal. What makes us categorize them as an animal anyway, and not a plant or a protist or a fungus? In fact, how do we classify in the first place? Well, this lets us jump right into our topic, classification. Taxonomy includes the naming and classification of species, and much of the credit for starting a formal classification goes to Carl Linnaeus. We'll get back to that a little bit later in this video. But back in his time, the 18th century, there wasn't a separate category for other organisms like protists or bacteria. They didn't know about detailed cell structure differences. They didn't know about DNA, so they didn't know genetic relationships that now can determine how we categorize organisms. And that's the thing about classification. As we learn more about DNA and therefore relatedness, how we classify organisms can continue to change. So first, let's look at an awesome hierarchy system mnemonic. There's a lot of great ones that you can find that people have shared online. We'd also love to share ours. Dear King Paramecium cares only for green spirulina, but we sort of have a thing for protest and we realize that might not be as memorable. So let's take a look at each group of this hierarchy, starting with one of the most inclusive groups, domains. Ah, domains. It's so awesome that all of life will fit into them. So there are three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The domain bacteria is full of bacteria. They're prokaryotes and therefore they have characteristics we've mentioned of prokaryotes before. These can include bacteria that make you sick, the bacteria that are in your intestines helping you digest, the bacteria helping with decomposing, the bacteria fixing nitrogen in the soil, tons of different kinds of bacteria. RK are prokaryotes too, but they have some major DNA and structure differences that give them their own domain. And while they may seem more closely related to bacteria since they are prokaryotes, Recent DNA evidence links them to having more in common with eukaryotes, which is interesting. Many of the RK are extremophiles. That is, many of them like the extremes. Some like extreme salt environments, for example, which means they can handle extremely salty environments like the Dead Sea. Or methanogens. They can live where there is very little oxygen. In fact, most of them can't even handle oxygen. They use carbon dioxide to make their energy instead and produce waste gas. Methane. Some of them live inside animals that eat a lot of cellulose, like cows or termites. Another extremophile is thermophiles. They like extreme temperatures. If you ever dreamed of living near the deep sea hydrothermal vents, well, if you were a thermophile, you'd be in luck. We mentioned that RK and bacteria domains are separate because they have some major DNA and structure differences that are significant enough to separate them. And so does the third domain, eukarya. These are eukaryotes, and so they have characteristics that we've mentioned before that are common for eukaryotes, and that's where we'll focus right now. So the next level, less inclusive and more specific than domains, is the level of kingdom. Now here is the big disclaimer about kingdoms. Its organization is often changing, and it's not even something that all scientists agree on. We've seen a five-kingdom system that looks like this, and a six-kingdom system that looks like this, and it's important to understand it's a changing view as we learn more about DNA and cell structure evidence. That's what makes classification so exciting. But if we focus on these eukaryotes, let's touch on them briefly. Protista, extremely diverse, and there's often talk about dividing it because of how diverse it is. There are protists that are animal-like and protists that are plant-like and protists that are fungi-like, but many scientists don't consider them to quite meet the requirements to be in those kingdoms. Protista includes both autotroph protists, making their own food, and heterotroph protists, which can consume other things for energy. Most protists are unicellular, but they can be multicellular. And some have cell walls made of cellulose, which is kind of similar to plants. 
and some don't. Fungi are heterotrophs, so no photosynthesis for them. If that's hard to remember, just think about athlete's foot. It's a fungus on your foot, and it's not doing any photosynthesis there because that'd be really weird. Nope, it's there, causing irritation, eating dead skin cells. Fungi are usually multicellular, but they can be unicellular. And most of them have cell walls of chitin. It's a carbohydrate. Next up, plantae. Plants are autotrophs. Yes, even the carnivorous plants, because they still make their glucose from sunlight energy. Plants are, for the most part, multicellular, and most have cell walls of cellulose. Finally, last up, animalia. Animals. Okay, Hydra, you can come back. This mostly multicellular and heterotroph kingdom is the kingdom to which you belong. So now we have the other hierarchy levels. We get less inclusive, therefore more specific, as we move down to the Hydra's phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Because the species name is the most specific that you can get, it is the least inclusive. Now, you'll notice we wrote its species name here. Remember how we said we'd bring up Carl Linnaeus again? Well, it's because of him that we have this naming system, binomial nomenclature. This two-part naming system that we use uses Latin or Greek roots. This is its scientific name. See that first name? That's its genus. It's written with a capital letter at the start, and it's written in italics. See the second name? That's its specific epithet, which is a fancy way of saying that it refers to one species in the genus. It has a lowercase letter, and it's also written in italics. So why do we care about these scientific names? Well, you could come up with a lot of common names for an organism that vary based on location. Take this mountain lion, for example. It's also known as a puma, cougar, or Texas panther. Same animal, different names. But its scientific name here is specific and recognized regardless of your location. And that gives power to an awesome way to organize and name species. Well, that's it for the Muba Sisters, and we remind you to stay curious.